Please let me introduce Pete Giorgio, the head of the U.S. sports practice at Deloitte, among if not the uh, top thought leader in the industry, uh, and kind of the perfect person to get our day started as we fancy ourselves in the same role. Uh, but please join me in welcoming Pete Giorgio. Round of applause for Scott. Come on. Go get him. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Morning, everybody. How are you? Did anybody watch the, the Taylor Swift video at 8? There was a special video. How was it? That was OK? All right. What's your name? Adrian? Adrian Smith. Round of applause for Adrian. Sitting in the front row. Sitting in the front row. There you go. Boom. All right. Well, welcome, everybody. I, um, this is an institution of learning, right? At least last I checked. Um, so I thought it would be helpful to kick off with a little bit of learning. So one of the worst things that you can do in the sports industry is try and predict what's going to happen in the sports industry. All right, so I just wanted to lay that groundwork for everybody, that it's, it's basically you're setting yourself up to be wrong, number one. So don't do that. Um, what's worse, though, is to get in front of a room of people, basically, what are we, 10 fifths, 10 twelfths of the way through, through the year, and talk about it. Because um, basically, we're just going to highlight what I did wrong last year. So, but are you guys up for a little bit of wrongness? And rightness. All right, cool. So what I thought we'd do is spend a little time today talking through, we put, the, put out a report every year, a sports outlook, where we try to predict some of the biggest sort of business trends that we're going to see in the upcoming year. What I thought we'd do was kind of go through the ones that we did last year, talk a little bit about those, get your guys' input if you guys are up for it on what we're going to do next year, because we're literally in the process of coming up with these, and then maybe finish up with some Q&A. One of the big things that we've been seeing um, is this sort of accelerated merging of the physical and the virtual. So you can just jump to the next slide. Um, it, this is an ongoing trend. And what we thought would be happening this year is, is as we just, at the end of last year, we were starting to use the word metaverse, right? We were starting to use um, AR and VR were happening in ways that were kind of new. I don't know if you remember, remember the Panthers did their AR thing with the Panther last year. We were starting to see some of that stuff come into the space. And we thought we'd see a lot of acceleration of that this year. And I think we have. Um, we've seen a lot of experimentation. Uh, we've seen a lot of things happen in that space. Uh, but it's interesting that you know, as we start to see what Meta and others are doing in this space, it hasn't really caught on, I think, as much as we have. So I'm going to put this one in the, we were a little early on that one. Does that work for you guys? So we're literally, but, but things are happening, right? Everybody's exploring the metaverse. Everybody's thinking about what's going to happen with virtual reality. I'm still a big proponent and a big fan of, of what's going to happen with augmented reality in sports. Um, soon as um, two of the biggest things I think that are going to affect sports in the next five years is when Apple and Google and everybody gets this right, right? When these glasses start making augmented reality easy um, and, and possible. One of, my, one of my favorite things to do with sports teams is to ask them how much they spent on their Jumbotron. Um, uh, any, any, any Patriots fans here? Yeah, all right, Patriots fans. They are building literally right now the, 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 a giant, uh, I think they're saying it's the biggest. I don't know if it's bigger than the Rams or not, but biggest screen that as soon as we have these things will be obsolete, right? As soon as augmented reality in a stadium is there, you and I can put the, sta the scoreboard wherever we want. We can literally say, I want a big jumbotron, I don't, things like that too. And that's above and beyond the sort of uh, the additional stats and things like that we'll get on people. So I still think this one is going to keep moving forward. I think I'm still a big fan of AR. Oh, by the way, the second thing that's going to fundamentally change sports from a technology perspective is when we get supersonic travel going again, right? As soon as we get supersonic travel, whether it's, you know, through jets or actually, you know, Jeff Bezos wants us to fly on rockets. Right, we're going to see a world where EPL teams can play over here, where NFL teams can play over here, and we can actually have divisions and things like that happening. So keep an eye out for that one. Um, so I think that one will continue, and I think we'll see more stuff in this space. Uh, we're going to talk about this one again this year. One of the interesting things about um, the metaverse, and especially virtual reality, that we're seeing is uh, not a top-line driver as much as a bottom-line driver. We're actually seeing a lot of interesting cost savings that are starting to happen using virtual reality, whether it's giving, uh, uh, do, doing renderings of stadiums in a way that allow you to sort of walk through them before you build them, whether it's sharing venues, uh, digital twins 
everyone's seen the sort of digital twin space in terms of recreating either a race car or things like that in a different environment so that you don't have to do as many test laps and things like that. So I think that's going to continue um, as well. Second thing, um, we've been talking a lot about what we call the omni-channel sports fan. Um, and I think, we think um, at Deloitte, that we're rapidly getting to a world where if you're a sports property, and, and think about sports property writ large, league, team, um, Olympics, things like that. One of the big things you're gonna have to do to meet the demands of you guys, right? I'm old, like I still will sit through a full basketball game. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but that, that's happening less and less. You, we've got to figure out where and how we can give you what you want, when you want it, right, in the format that you want it, and with the other people you want to do it with, right? And it's no longer going to be up to us to dictate all of that, right? You guys are going to demand, and I say you guys, I'm also talking about your little brothers and sisters and those kids that are 12 years old now that as soon as you're standing up here in front of the stage, you're going to have to sell sports to, all right? They're going to want this across all of these things. They're going to want uh, scripted content. They're going to want live content. They're going to want archive content. They're going to want data. They're going to want to see it on their phone, on their TV, uh, with their headset, in the metaverse, in real life. They're going to want to do it with their friend who's sitting in Manchester and their friend who's sitting in Japan and their friend that's sitting in Joburg all at the same time. right? And we're going to have to figure out how we do that. Right? The leagues and the properties that figure out how they do that are the ones that are going to be most relevant, especially to the next generation, especially to the next generation. So that's important, too. College fans. Any college sports fans in here, one or two? Uh, how's Columbia's football team doing this year, by the way? Do we know? We're OK this year? All right. Yeah. Lions, right? Game tomorrow. Game tomorrow? All right, cool. Um, the, in case you haven't noticed, there's a couple new things happening in college sports. Anybody paying attention? I mean, it's, it's amazing to me. You know, one of the things that typically consultants get brought in in places that are undergoing change. That's, that's kind of where we, we typically make our living. And there's no place in sports right now that's going through more change than college athletics. The, uh, the name, image, and likeness things that are happening, um, the transfer portal, uh, the role, the, the NCA is literally transforming itself right now. It's transforming itself. It's kind of, it's funny. They've kind of stepped to the side a little bit. Well, a lot of this is happening while they do this. Um, um, uh, conference realignment. You may have noticed that there's a little bit of a conference realignment happening. So, so what's happening in college sports right now is there's this shifting of power. And the interesting part is everybody has a different sense of where that power is going to land. Right? Traditionally, a lot of that lived with the NCAA. Obviously, some of the bigger conferences are stepping up. But, but you know, athletes are having more and more of a voice in this. Um, you know, being, I, I don't know if we have any, any, being a college coach, by the way, these days in athletics is a nightmare, right? Because not only do you have to recruit, you know, new players, but you got to recruit to keep your old players and, and all of those things. And it's hard, right? It's hard. And so we're seeing a lot of that shifting of power. I don't know where it's going to land. Right? I don't know. We're going to talk a little bit about this in next year's, um, where it's going to land. But I do think it's going to fundamentally change what's happening in college. You know, one year, two years, maybe three years from now, college athletics is going to look completely different. There's going to have to be some regulation that comes in. There's going to have to be some changes. The NCAA will still be part of that equation, but how big or how small, I don't know. Depends a little bit. Anybody here want to be the new administrator for the NCAA? They're looking for one. So. <laughs> Where's Scott? Scott, you how you happy these days? Or good. you're good? All right, cool. So um, that's a hard job, right? That would be a, that would be a hard job. So, uh, but I think we'll continue to see that move. We'll continue to see that shift. Um, anybody? I'm a Division three athlete, right? Anybody other Division three athletes? There you go. I knew I liked you, Adrian. All right, cool. Um, there you go. All right, cool. I also think we haven't really started to see the effect on Division II and Division III in college athletics as well. I mean, NIL is a thing there as well, right? Some of these you know, conference realignment, I don't know if it'll hit the Ivy League or not, but, but who knows, right? This stuff can be catching and things like that. So I don't know what's going to happen on that front. I think the more interesting thing is what all this is doing to high school athletes, right? And talk about a place that's unregulated and a place where there's all sorts of interesting behavior. 
NIL absolutely applies to high school athletes. Uh, you're seeing uh, groups like Overtime, right, in basketball, and Team Ignite in the G League doing really interesting things with, with athletes. We've had IMG Academy and groups like that for a while. We certainly have had soccer academies forever. And so I think this is also, it's gonna have this amazing trickle-down effect across that entire ecosystem in a way that I think is gonna be fascinating. Um, and I wish I knew where it was gonna land. I, I'd probably make a lot more money if I knew exactly where all that was gonna land. Uh, but I think we've got a lot of chapters of that one to go. All right, I needed to do a poll real quick. All right, NFTs. Number one, who owns an NFT? There we go. That's not too bad, that's not too bad. All right, raise your hand if you think it's, we're, we're done with NFTs. No, yeah, we got a couple. Raise your hand if you think we're just in a lull and we think they're coming back. All right, well, then we got a lot of people who are either undecided or, or not awake yet, right? So, um, NFTs are fascinating to me, fascinating to me. They, um, uh, we, we first started talking about blockchain uh, in the very first report we put out five, six, seven years ago, something like that. And, and everybody that I talked to said, what is this blockchain thing? That's never gonna do anything. I don't understand it. And then suddenly Hot Shots came, right? Suddenly Hot Shots came out on the scene and it went insane, right? It went insane. Um, so I, I think NFTs, um, I think they're here to stay. I, I'm a... I think blockchain technologies in general are here to stay. They're going to be a fundamental part. Web3, and we can have a whole separate conversation about Web3. All that stuff's here to stay. Whether it's collectibles or seat licenses or tickets or some of the really cool stuff that companies like Socios are doing and things like that, I'm not exactly sure. But I do think that this technology, this idea of a public ledger, this idea of creating more access uh, to things like tickets and stuff like that is only gonna grow and it's here to stay. You guys agree with me or, or what do you think? Yeah, all right, I'm getting some nods. Did we do it okay? Um, I, and I don't know what that is yet. I mean, I, my challenge to you guys, especially the students here, is you're gonna have to help us figure this out. It's gonna be the really bright, I don't know how old you guys are, 28, 29, 30, 50 uh, year olds. They're gonna come up with the really cool new ideas and things to do. You're gonna go work for the Islanders, right? And help them do something new and different that they do. And it'll be that type of innovation that really pushes us forward. Um, there's a couple things I'm hearing about in the, in the corners of the sports market that people are working on. I do believe there's a next wave of this that's probably a little less collected to connected to collectibles and a lot more towards make it more fundamental in the industry that I think is gonna be pretty cool. Can I do another poll? How many people placed a sports bet in the past month? How, rate, keep your hand up if you won on that bet. <laughs> All right, that's not bad. Well done, well done. Um, sports betting is fascinating to me. I, I would say it's, I, I, last year I would have told, maybe the beginning of last year I would have told you that's the place where the most change was happening in sports, especially in the US. I think college kind of is eclipsing that a little bit, but it's still, right? You've still got states coming online. Uh, you've got different rules in every state. You've got California making everybody throw up their arms and saying, wait, what is going on? Um, this continues to be a place where there's a whole bunch of change, but a bunch of opportunity um, in the space. And you know, we're starting to see, you know, it was funny um, when we first wrote this, the jury was still out a little bit about where the money was gonna land and who was gonna make money how, but I think we're starting to see the methods people are making money on this, right? Um, so the, 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 the properties are making money selling sponsorships um, and selling data, right? Those are, the, those are the places that the properties are making. Uh, it's interesting to me the way a lot of the broadcasters, the media companies, have really sort of come into this space and sort of seen this as a way to drive engagement as we move forward. The data companies that aggregate the data. So it's funny, the, you know, the casinos are kind of in there now and are starting, you know, we've got BetMGM and others, but I, I don't think we've seen, the, I think a lot of them are kind of seeing where this thing lands. Um, and I think we may see some big plays on that front too. But I, I think there's a lot more to go. I also think everybody's kind of waiting a little bit to sort of see if some sort of national legislation comes out on this. There hasn't been a ton of talk, at least that I'm aware of recently, 
about that happening. Um, I think it'll probably more happen in college sports before it happens in the betting space, but who knows? You never know. We're going to have a new administration here at some point, too. So we'll see what Congress wants to do with that moving forward. But I, again, I do think it's going to be a big piece of the sports landscape. Um, all of my friends in the UK always laugh at me because they're like, we've been doing this for years. You guys are just catching up. And then I start to show them the numbers. And they're like, oh, yeah, I guess we should pay attention to that. So good one, too. Um, and then lastly, um, last year and this year, we talked about the well-being side of sports, right? And this, for us, um, there's a whole bunch of different facets of well-being in sports. Obviously, we've seen a whole bunch of stuff about the negative side of well-being in sports and their effect um, in, in a bunch of different places. Um, mental health, huge issue, huge issue in sports, and that's all the way up and down the board. Anxiety, right? Anxiety disorders. We, we have an epidemic uh, of anxiety disorders. By the way, writ large, never just, never mind just with athletes and things like that. But for me, the exciting part about this is a lot of this has led to uh, an increased share of voice of athletes, right? We've got athletes who are stepping up and really embracing that sort of role model part of what they do to sort of talk about their mental health challenges, to talk about the things that they've gone through, to sort of shine a light on the terrible, terrible things that have been happening in sports and really bring those to light. And we see um, social media and other platforms like that um, really being a place where athletes can bring that voice to the market, can bring that voice to all of us and help be part of that. And this, this empowerment of athletes, I think, is fundamentally going to be one of the biggest shifts that we're going to see over the next 10 years in the power of athletes and their influence. Um, anybody familiar with Athletes Unlimited? I love that model. So if anybody, if you haven't looked at them in, in your sport management program, look them up. They, I, again, I will see if they're successful, and I think they've got some challenges ahead, but they literally said, you know what, we don't, this idea of a league, we don't really need that, right? We're going to really just focus on the athletes. Um, there's some interesting stuff happening in esports around athletes, and, and I don't know if you guys have seen, there's a, there's a few platforms out there now uh, where they basically do a GoFundMe um, around how much would you pay to see Adrian and Pete play League of Legends against each other tonight? Everybody goes, fund me. If they get enough money, we play against each other. If we don't, you know, Adrian and I got better things to do, right? We need, we need to get paid, right? So um, I do think this idea of athletes at the center and the power of athletes is going to continue to move forward, especially as we think about well-being and what's going on on that front. So that's what we talked about last year. Again, I think... I feel pretty good about these and how we talked about them. Again, in some ways, this stuff is, you know, these things tend to sort of keep going and going and going. Um, a couple of things that we're thinking about for next year. Um, a couple of them are continuations. Uh, I do think we're going to start to see in this coming year, um, somebody's going to start making money on the metaverse in sports. I don't know where and how and what they're going to do, but something's going to come out. Now, will it be a killer app like Hot Shots that really sort of propels everything? I'm not sure, uh, but somebody's going to start making money uh, on that front. College. Basically, what's happening is, and I know this is a, for the lawyers in the room, this, has, this is a loaded term, but college is becoming more professionalized, right? That's essentially what's happening. And so I think we're going to continue to see that trend. So we're going to talk a little bit about what it means to be professionalized as we go forward. On the betting front, um, we think that we're going to start to see some of the downside of the growth of betting next year, especially if the economy you know, does what, what, what some people think it's going to do. We think some of the challenges of having increased sports betting well, it's interesting. I have a debate with my colleagues of whether or not there's increased sports betting in the U.S. or it's just been brought to light and it's, and it's more legitimate sports betting. But we're going to start to see some of the effects of that uh, moving forward. And then lastly, one of the things that we're going to be playing with next year um, that is, is a kind of a new one. Um, anybody from the private equity space or the fund? There's an int really interesting thing happening in private equity institutions right now around sports where we're starting to see a lot of um, sports is becoming a, a formalized asset group in a lot of private equity companies. Um, and you might say, what is, well, who cares, right? But actually, that's going to drive some real – so sport, sports, looking at sports teams, looking at sports properties – used to be a fun little task that people would sort of do in their spare time at a lot of PE firms. 
it's now a formalized group. And so you're gonna start to see a lot of very analytical, formalized um, investment into sports I, in a way that I don't know that sports is used to, <laughs> right? Because when you're a PE firm, you're, you know, you're in and you're out. You have very high expectations on return, very high expectations on those exits. And that's different than how a lot of, you know, sports franchise especially are things you buy so that you can hand off to your grandchildren, right, or have been historically. And so I think there's gonna be some interesting things starting to happen in, their sp in that space. In addition, there's a lot of really cool companies that are trying to, all of the leagues, one of the challenges that they've been trying to address over the past few years is um, the challenges of minority owners, limited partners in a lot of these, um, a lot of these franchises, and the, the um, um, uh, getting, how they can get access to their capital, right? And so you're seeing a lot of companies and a lot of leagues thinking about how I, can I create some liquidity in that market? Um, I, I always call being a limited partner in a team having, you know, 0.5% as the world's most expensive season ticket, right? Because <laughs> you basically get that and that's it. You get a seat, right? But there's some interesting people. There's already some investment from some uh, special purpose vehicles and private equity firms thinking about that space. But the really cool part is there's some companies out there thinking about how do we make a market out of those things, right? How do we go into these? How do we buy up some of these um, the, 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 some of this equity and create a tradable market out there so you and I could actually start to think about where and how we trade in and trade out of these things. It's a little bit like what they did in Green Bay, except it's actually you can sort of get in, you can get out. Right? You still won't have any voting rights. You still don't get to pick the starting lineup uh, for Thursday night. You probably won't even get seats. right? Uh, but it'll be a new and interesting way for fans to sort of engage with teams uh, in a different way and maybe make a little money too. So. So that's what we're thinking about. I'd hope to leave more time for questions, but I would love any, anything, I, anything that you think we should talk about next year that I didn't bring up. Yeah. So when you're talking about things like the metaverse, which can be pretty transcendent in the industry, uh, in, my, in my opinion anyway, it comes down to making it affordable to the masses. Yeah. Is anything really coming out or coming forth that's going to be improving? Because right now, I know with, uh, with Meta specifically, yeah. How, how many people own a VR headset? Let's see, not many. God, I would have thought more of you guys. Yeah. And so your point is, those things are expensive. I mean, I don't know how expensive they are right now. Yeah. 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 And that's so five hundred, six hundred dollars for for some. And the and the higher, the upper end ones, I think, are a lot more expensive. So. Um, and so the question was just, how is that going to affect access to the metaverse and things like that? Obviously, it's going to make it hard. Right, it's going to make it hard. Um, you know, I do think one of the funny things, one of the things that, that they've got to sort of tackle is the people who can afford them are the people who are least interested in them. The people who are most interested in them can't necessarily afford them, right? Um, there's some kids who have wealthy parents that, that, that are doing okay, but they are corporations, right? So, um, you know, I think as with any technology, that price will continue to come down, right? That price will continue to come down. There will be a day and a time where, where, and I don't know what'll happen if the two will merge, but you know, at some point, you're gonna put that headset on instead of watching your TV, right? And $500 for a TV, you know, that's, that's, that's not the worst thing in the world. But I, I think that price will continue to come down. I don't think it's happening this year, though. So, um, I do, but again, I'm telling you, the glasses, once the glasses come out and I buy these instead of my phone, that, that'll, that'll be one of the game changers. So Google did uh, Google Glass a couple years ago. Yeah. Um, it's going to be one of the big challenges they have. Like, how do we think about? I mean, even the even the the ones that Facebook came out this year, the Ray Bans, yeah. right? They're trying to think about where and how privacy and 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 the camera, especially. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that would be illegal. Right. Yeah, yeah. Well, oh, actually, it wouldn't be because I signed a thing saying I could be recorded. So, so. <laughs> Other questions? Uh, yeah. Mm. Similarly, we'll also have the kind of presumably on the at-home viewing experience. Are you anticipating a problem with maybe selling tickets in the future if the at-home viewing experience uh, is vastly improved? So, so the question is, you know, as VR and AR get better, right, are you going to have trouble selling tickets to go, the Islanders are going to have trouble selling tickets to their new venue, right? 
I think eventually there's going to be some interesting challenges that happen there. But, I mean, I, I, has anyone tried to watch an entire game uh, with a VR headset yet? It's, it's not, it was not good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's not there yet, right? It's, it's, it's tiresome. It hurts you. Like, we're not quite there yet. Um, but once we are, I do think it's going to be a little bit of a challenge. But I don't know. There's something. It's going to take a lot of technology. I was at, uh, I was at watching the Chargers game Monday night in SoFi Stadium. Like, that feeling... That energy, that, that, I, there's, there's still a place in that in my sports fandom. Yes, I still love watching, you know, the Patriots on TV, and I still love, but going to Fenway, there's something there that I think they'll still be, they'll still be a tug for. One of the big things everybody talks about is millennials, 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 and what are they going to want to do? The big thing we know about millennials is, is we like to get together and do things. We don't like to do things by ourselves, and what better place to do that than a stadium, so... Do I have time? Do you want me to stop? Or one more? Okay, cool. One more. How about, I want a question there from a. What are your thoughts on pickleball? My thoughts <laughs> on pickleball. How many people played? I, I've avoided it so far because every single person I talk to is like, is, is, is obsessed with it, right? And I'm a little worried. I shouldn't say this, but I'm a little worried that it's like a, a sport that's, that would be easy for out of shape old people like me to play. So, um, but I love it. I, I love the popularity. I love the accessibility of it. Obviously, Kevin Durant and Tom Brady and some others um, see a future in it. W will it become you know, the next big professional sport? I, I, I don't know. I mean, any of the lacrosse players in here, we've been waiting for lacrosse to sort of blow up for years <laughs> and years and years, right? So. I don't know, but I still think it is, it, there's something about it that's caught the imagination, especially here in the U.S., um, that's actually going to be really interesting to watch. I think it'll be, I mean, I think the bigger question is, is it going to get into, you know, it won't get straight into the Olympics, but do we see it in the Pan Am games first or things like that, too? That'll be the more, the more interesting part. Do you play? No. Why not? <laughs> Why not? You got to try it. There you go. Cool. All right. Well, thank you, guys. All right. Thank Great. you, Pete. That was fantastic. Appreciate it.